Konnichiwa. Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Kia ora, Catherine. Konnichiwa, Jane. How excited are we? It has been quite a week so far, hasn't it? Starting off with our fantastic fundraising event at the Tokyo Tower on Monday night. Wow. wow. Wasn't that amazing? The weather turned up for us. Oh, so brilliant. great. It was predicted yes. to have rain, but it was brilliant. Blue sky. Fantastic. That started us out, didn't it? For the yeah. whole two, two to three hours that we had fundraising for uh, the flooding post cyclone in New Zealand. Yes. So if you're wondering, what are they talking about? Well, <laughs> A few weeks ago, well, obviously, after we saw the, the, the cyclone, the devastation that just uh, was being reported from New Zealand, you and I were both thinking, what can we do? And another one of our jandals, Kinjo-san, uh, Kinjo Makoto-san, was also thinking, what can we do? And so we put our heads together, we brought in our individual skills, connections, <laughs> and created a series of barbecue events across Japan. And it ended up being just two events in the end. One held at Tokyo Tower uh, in Tokyo. The other held at Rosenberry, which is a beautiful English garden uh, down in Shiga Prefecture, which is owned by uh, Osawa Wines, right? An Osawa Corporation, I think it's called. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. And they put on a barbecue event. We put on a barbecue event at Tokyo Tower we were at Tokyo Tower for the Tokyo Tower event. There was 150 something people there. Exactly. Friends Such of New Zealand great number. coming together to raise funds. It was a fantastic night. Was. Amazing sponsors helped us, right? Exactly. Low key event in terms of just getting there, eating, drinking, being happy, um, getting together with people we hadn't been getting together with for a while, but all for a great cause. And it was lovely to have uh, the Trade Commissioner Kylie Archer there too, as well as Hamish Cooper, the ambassador from New Zealand to Japan, just uh, being there and communicating with the crowd, but very, very joyous occasion for mm. such a, a terrible thing that happened in New Zealand. We were so happy to be able to support in some way. Yeah. We're not event organizers, but we got our skills together, as Jane said, and just worked on each of our individual skills up to the event and on the night to make it happen. And we just got such great feedback from people that they enjoyed it. They thought it was just a really great event. And we've managed to actually get together some great donations. And that's, yeah. the, that's what it was all about at the end of the day was getting a donation together. So tell us about that, Jane. Yeah, so we haven't got the final, final, final calculations done yet, but we think that it's going to be around 3 million yen that has been generated from these two events. So that's just amazing, isn't it? That it is. well done, everyone. Well, thank you to our sponsors for making it possible. Thank you to all the the people, both Japanese and New Zealanders, who came out and barbecued. <laughs> great barbecuing was happening. Some great uh, networking was happening. It's been a long time since we've had an an event oh, like goodness. this. I think so, and... such a big big night. And wow, three million yen. Let's just hold that. That's a small group like us, people of three only in a group, plus our massive supporters, sponsors mm. can do something. Imagine what we can all do as individuals in this world to help any organization uh, for the cause. Really mm. feeling very proud about that and so happy that we can do something. And uh, we will be sending that all the way over to New Zealand through New Zealand Red Cross. And we thank Jan's uh, mm. Japan, Australia, New Zealand organization for being the uh, conduit for the money. Yeah, thanks for helping us with that. Uh, in Japan. Thank you so yeah. much. The amazing team that were also there on the day to help us from Jans. Well done. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I think uh, that one of the things that you heard, Catherine, at the event was that we need more of these kinds of yes. events, New Zealanders and friends of New Zealand, Japanese people coming together in Japan just to yeah, enjoy each other's company and yeah, create things together. So we are thinking what that might look like going forward. Exactly. Yeah. We're going to have some fun doing that. And obviously, anytime anyone who's listening has any suggestions for the way we could bring people together, uh, we would love to hear from you. So please do let us know. But we're planning things already in mm. our little part of the world. Yes. <laughs> 
One more would be oh. there is one more uh, event happening on the 27th of April at the Tokyo American Club, and tickets are being sold through the Australia New Zealand Chamber of Commerce in Japan mm. website. So if you hop on over there, you can book a ticket to go to. It's a stand up buffet. There are plenty of raffles, different style of Amazing event, lots things of things going on there. there rugby signed jerseys, uh, lunches at local and sophisticated. Tokyo establishments, uh, wine, all kinds of things uh, there. There's an online auction as well as on the night. So please head on over, keep the keep the generosity going. Uh, we'd love to support Gisborne in particular. That is that event is aimed at Gisborne uh, to go to Supergrands, the local on the ground organization. So thank you so much to Jackie, who's organizing that one. And we hope to see you back over there on the 27th. Mm, not much time to sign up if you're listening to this straight out of the gates. But yeah, get yourself over to that event. It's going to be a great night sold. as well. Yeah. Mm. All right. And so moving on to mm. this episode, we are hearing from the Mike Harris. Hardly needs an need... introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Can we call him Mr. Adventure Tourism in Japan? Mm, I think, I we think can. so. I think so. We had a fantastic conversation with him. He had us chuckling as well as gobsmacked with our yeah. mouths opened at some of the things he told us. Such really, a good time. really fun guy. Uh, obviously, a pioneer in the industry here trusted member of the community he gives a great few stories about how he got himself embedded in his community and earned won the trust of people around him through nemawashi uh, and also other ways to just mm. gain the confidence of his organizations there to support him in what he's doing in his adventure tourism with kenyans uh up in minakami mm, minakami so yeah if you're thinking oh i'd love to start some adventure tourism or why isn't there more adventure tourism in japan this is a great episode and if you're listening from new zealand and you're in adventure tourism you're going to love this episode so let's hear it from mike harris kia ora mike welcome to the jandals in japan podcast great to have you on the show today kia ora guys great to be here so we like to start off with a bit of a warm-up question and our question for you is What's your favorite undiscovered part of Japan, apart from where you live, obviously, because you could probably go and tell us about that later, anywhere else? Wow, that's a, that's a tough question. I, I travel so much through Japan and there's so many cool places that I visit. Um, I guess recently I've been working a lot in southern Kyushu. There's a little town there called Hitoyoshi, uh, which I've been discovering a lot of the last couple of years. Um, 700 year old history uh sort of been ruled by one family the sagara family and it's just got a really cool history the the roots wow. of shochu in japan you know one of the first rice growing areas of japan um there's some cool uh kenjutsu sort of uh japanese martial arts that started there as well so that's one of my one of my favorite areas and the other favorite area, i really really like uh kochi kochi prefecture mm. in, in shikoku uh the rivers there are amazing you know awesome uh, coastline, the the waves. Um, I I don't shouldn't let too much out of the bag, but um, <laughs> local surfers won't be happy. And uh, the seafood, you know, seafood and, yeah. and and the people there are just so so warm and friendly. So um, yeah, a couple a couple of spots, but um, there's so many on the list. Um, yeah, we might get into a few more as we get through the podcast. Yeah, thank you for that. Wow, yes, Kochi looks amazing. The this the river colors down there are so beautiful and they have a few different things you can do enjoying the actual river down there don't they that like various oh yeah all like rafting kolboke, and things oboke, kolboke. you know they had the rafting world cup down there in uh 2010 i believe hmm. so uh yeah all the kiwis were down there as well great stuff catherine you got any uh, we we probably just Ooh. need to defer to mike here on this i think mike's one. just <laughs> taken the cake on that one hey is Kagawa and Kochi Prefecture. Uh, Kagawa is the Kagawa is the prefecture across from Kochi. Oh well, I'll name that one and claim that one then, because Kagawa's one place I went to. I got a sort of hotel ryokan stay coupon and headed down there. I had no idea where I was going, and I had to look at the map. Even when I got there, I'm like, where am I? Mm -hmm. uh, and it was so fantastic because from there you could go to Naoshima Island, but also just hanging around Kagawa. The udon is famous. I had a ball. I loved it. Wandering around the old streets, 
this sort of used to foreigners but not used to foreigners and it was just a lot of fun and getting out into the hinterland is so much well it's just joyous right because it's japan unseen and not like the city and i love it so that would be my one kagawa Mm -hmm. jane what about you (laughs) well pretty much the only place i ever go when i'm not here in fukushima is to totori so another vote for totori which i've mentioned on other episodes and especially Daisen, such a beautiful mountain where you yeah, can see this. Yeah, it's been a bit of time in Daisen around the yeah. Totori area. The, you know, it's cool, the sand dunes, some of the cool old uh, temples up up in the up in the mountains and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Giant Mount, salamander. Mount Mitok- Mitoku, climbing mm. up there in your Waraji, the, the, mm. those, um, <laughs> what are they, like sandals made out of grass. Some mm. people do it. I wouldn't recommend it, but um yeah it was it was a good time climbing up there to see the the mountain temples very cool all righty thanks for that i'm inspired well mike we will be putting your full bio into the show notes later but tell us about your background in new zealand first up uh, and your journey to japan which i believe happened in the 90s and then you came into doing this introducing as one of the pioneers of uh, adventure tourism in japan so tell us a bit more about all of that yeah so I started off uh, studying Japanese at, at high school in uh, in New Zealand. I guess uh, at that time there was a few ninja movies coming out, and you know some old samurai sort of Jedi geeky sort of um, period pieces and stuff. And I got sort of a little bit hooked into martial arts. I started karate at that time. The big p- point there was our teacher, our Japanese teacher, was this little old Japanese lady, Kawachi Sensei. Um, at high school in Dunedin and she just made the the learning so fascinating and she was I guess she had a very different style com- compared to the sort of more laid back um, you know New Zealand style of teaching she was very very strict and you know she she had sincere concern about her students you know and <laughs> it was like not that New Zealand shoot, uh, teachers don't but you know she you know um, it's a bit of a different level, she would make it? sushi for us uh, you know um, she would take us out on little excursions and um just the uh, the level of passion for her students was was next level, and she she really sparked the interest in Japanese. And a bunch of my mates, we all started studying together. So all through high school in Dunedin, I studied Japanese, and uh, I wanted to do it at uni, but they didn't have it at Otago at that time. So I went to Otago University, but continued Japanese extramurally through um, Massey mm-hmm. uh, at the time. And after my first year of, uh, of Massey, is, we had an opportunity through Massey University to do an exchange to Japan. So the university set up this exchange to Shizuoka Prefecture, a little town called Fujieda. Uh, the Lions Club there sorted out sort of homestays and jobs for us. Me um, and sort of uh, two of my good mates, plus two other Kiwis, um, uh, ended up in a small town, all working at gas stations. Um, <laughs> I was on route. <laughs> I was on Route Highway 1 um, with another good mate of mine who is actually now the deputy ambassador in Japan. Um, good, really good, Yeah, good mate of mine. So we both started out at gas stations um, in, in Fujieda. Hilarious. Yeah, but it was a great um, great introduction for us. It was just about learning Japanese, you know, being being immersed in the culture and, you know, with the, with the homestay family, sort of learning about how Japanese people live from day to day. So that was a really cool first introduction for me to Japan, um, that was in 1992 after my first year of university. And um, I went uh, up to the ski resorts and you know, no one really knew about the ski resorts in the, in the early 90s in Japan. It was sort of came about after the 98 Olympics. Um, and I went up and I thought, holy cow, Japan's got snow. Um, you know, <laughs> I'd, I'd grown up skiing in central Otago, um, you know. Sure. Cardies and triple cone and mm. um i think that 1992 i'd use my student loan to to buy a season pass and some skis yeah. to go to spend most of my time up at triple <laughs> cone but um turned out to be a good investment um but um yeah so uh, i found about the snow here and i was like wow this is uh next level so after uh heading back to university and graduating in um you know the end of 94 I sort of, uh, I, my friend had uh, gone and worked in Hakuba the, pre- the season before. He just sent off some faxes in Japanese. And one place, you know, it's, it's unbelievable the fax is still alive today. But um, he uh, he uh, sent off some faxes in one one place to return and said, yeah, we'd, we'd like to take some some people, uh, some international 
uh, workers on, which was very uh, progressive for, for those mm. times. So we were there the we were there in the second season, 1994-95 season, and working at the same lodge, a little place called Hapo Lodge, right in front of the um, Hapone Gondola. Mm. And there was probably five other foreigners in town um, at, at that time. Yeah, now there's probably 500 living there. But um, yeah, just got to ski every day. You know, just abs- literally every day go skiing, just ripping it up. And I bumped into a Kiwi guy um, when I was up skiing one day. I had this quite interesting sort of episode where um, I, I pulled up at the top of a top of the, one of the advanced sort of uh, ski race runs. And I was in my ski racing gear and, you know, sort of um, this guy pulls up beside me. He had the same skis and looks like, oh, this guy's like a racer. And we just sort of looked across at each other and this impromptu race sort of ensued. And we went <laughs> flying down the, down the, you know, down the advanced course and off all these jumps and flying down, both pulled up at the bottom together. And he pulled off his goggles. I pulled off mine. He goes, oh, you're a foreigner. I said, oh, bro. He goes, oh, you're a Kiwi. And it turns out he was, um, he was quite a famous groomer um, who used to go around the world grooming sort of World Cup circuits and stuff like that. Um, and his name was Chance. And Chance told me on the ski lift, we rode up the ski lift, did a few more runs together. He told me all about um, a mate of his that was starting the first rafting company in Japan in a place called Minakami. So I thought, wow, that sounds pretty interesting. You know, it's, it's uh, good money, you know, barbecue every day, mm. lots of young ladies. And when you're 19, 20 years old or 21 years old in Japan, you know, that's sort of part of your motivation to be here as well. So um <laughs> So, uh, you know, I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. But I'd always really wanted to um, to live in the city, coming from not really small town Dunedin, but for compared to Japan, it's small town. So I always wanted to try, try live in Tokyo. So that spring I um, packed up and went down to, to live in Tokyo. Um, got a job in Rapongi working in a bar, as you do. I was there for about three weeks and got, thought, uh, this kind of sucks you know I'm, not, I'm mm-hmm. not, I've just come been living in the mountains having this great sort of outdoor lifestyle and but it's not really you know Tokyo's fun but it's not really not really me and I remembered you know I had an epiphany one night probably about 3 a.m out drinking in a bar it's like if a guy called Chance tells you about something you you got to go check it out right mm-hmm. so next day I'd, I'd forgotten the name and the company that he gave me and all that information so I rang up JTB and said can you give me the name of all the rafting companies in Japan there was only two at the time so one of them was called great outdoors i said no that's it so rang up the company this guy called steve answered steve fleet and he goes i said i'm a kiwi yeah done a bit of rafting in new zealand and keen to get out he goes oh it's perfect looking for more people we've just started out you know so i moved up to minakami and went rafting down the tono river first day flipped three times and said this is awesome this is what i don't want to be doing (laughs) um so yeah, that was the start of my how I made it to Minakami, mm. all because of chance. Well, because of chance, oh taking a chance on chance. Wow! Oh, awesome story! Fantastic I've, story! I've, I've never met him. I've never met him again since. <laughs> no chance, way. where are you? Yeah. Yeah. Hilarious. Gosh, he must be out there. I actually went back. Um, I think he's in Methven, and I actually went through Methven to to look him up, and but I couldn't find him just to say thanks, man. And so, sort of, you know, mm, I got it'll here come. today. Yeah, one day it'll happen. Must be on I Facebook, loved how you surely. also went back, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to your early days of learning Japanese and how the teacher that you have to teach you Japanese can really signify where you're going to go. You know, I think of my teacher was Mizusawa Sensei at the Christchurch Polytechnic, and she'd have us round on Sunday nights for you know sushi and other food at her place we learned lots of stuff that i never really knew i was sponging up at that time Mm. but it's like you you just get right into it from the very beginning and the culture and it just brings you look what's happened it's brought you to japan and you've put down your roots here yeah for sure and not just i mean not just me she had uh you know there's a whole sort of legion of of uh people from dunedin that that ended up in japan you know there's there's uh guys from my high school that are still scattered all around japan all because of uh kawachi sensei so wow mm. there you yeah. go hopefully yeah. we're doing it proud i hope so Aww. i hope so too i think you probably are by the looks of it you just had me in stitches so entertaining to hear your introduction Thank you yes, so much. That's for the best that. one yet, I think. Yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, and I just need to verify. Did you just say that Dom? Is it yeah. Dom? 
Dom, Dom France. Dom yeah. was the Dom petrol was station guy. Pouring <laughs> gas. Yeah, me and Dom went to high school together. No. Oh, we've been we've hilarious. been mates since like ten years old, and we first came to Japan no. together. And um, oh, shout out Dom. to Dom. That's amazing. Dom's been a good friend of the podcast, uh, helping sure us out. And stuff. Thank you so much, Dom. But I yeah, think oh, I'm well. crying now with laughter. <laughs> <laughs> but the image of Dom pouring gas at the, pouring gas. the petrol yeah, station. Yeah, I have to be careful of the stories I tell about Dom. Oh, now. yeah. Yes, so be careful. <laughs> Very good. Wow, so you got in there with Steve, and what happened? I mean, you must have had to sort of get yourself going, find people to come and play around, uh, you know, rafting. Yeah. What did you do? How did yeah, you I mean, out? that was uh, 1995, spring 1995 right. was, was Steve's second season here. He started off just with him, by himself for the first season and, and sort of one other sort of Kiwi that was Kiwi that was helping out. So I came in season number two with him. He had a crew come across from New Zealand of sort of um, some rafting legends. So they really got me up to speed on, you know, sort of, I'd rafted a bit before, but never professionally. They took me under their wing. You know, I had one of New Zealand's top kayakers and, you know, two or three of the legend raft guides from, from around Rotorua, um, Roto Vegas, just teaching me every day, you know, on the river and off the river, um, all sorts of uh, old dog river tricks. You know, just, uh, I was on this sort of mission from then. I sort of like, I just want to become, you know, I want to be the best rafting guide in the world. So I sort of learned that, you know, you can really travel with this. So after the second season in Japan, went to Oz and did a season on the Tully uh, up in Cairns. And that was a bit of a culture shock. Um, I never thought that people actually call you bluey all the normal expletives and everything that you'd expect from a rafting community and uh, all mixed in with that very, very uh, unique Northern Queensland accent. It was a bit of a culture shock to tell the truth, but um, yeah, made a lot of good friends there as well. And um, I ended up recruiting a lot of the, the boys from there. There was a few Kiwis and a few Aussies and pulled them over to, to the crew in, um, in Minakami and things at that stage, you know, the media was starting to starting to pick up on rafting because it was something pretty new and, in Japan, so we're getting a lot of all what I sort of you know sort of variety programs and sort of um, things coming up and a lot of TV. So really, the the number of uh, you know people wanting to to come up rafting really really increased. There was one other Japanese rafting company uh, here as well, and that was from Japanese guys that had actually originally worked in New Zealand had come back and to to set up here. So rafting really started to take a take a hold and. Minakami is sort of one of the first sort of adventure sports to hit Japan. So I worked at Great Outdoors for a few seasons and learned a lot. But, um, you know, I guess uh, I didn't really agree with the way that, that Steve ran things. You know, he was a, he was a pioneer. He was definitely a pioneer in his own terms. And But uh, after traveling around and working for lots of different uh, organizations, I went and worked for another Kiwi in Nepal. Um, Dave Allardyce, the gas man, who was one of the very, very famous pioneers of pioneered all the rafting in Nepal. So, you know, after seeing all these different rafting companies and different operations and how they run, I, I sort of came to the conclusion that I really need to start up my own thing. And I could probably do it better than than the way that things have probably been run run there. So, so um, yeah, in 1998, after coming back from uh, a Nepal season, I, uh, I started up Canyons. I was... Uh, inside another rafting company a little company called uncle bear i was managing i started managing that for him and i said i wanted to start up the canyoning version uh the, the canyoning portion of um of your company and he said yeah that's fine and i said look i'll keep on managing the rafting for you they were first starting out canyoning in nepal in spring of 98 and uh they, they brought across some um european canyoning guides to set up the first canyons uh in nepal and the resort that I was working back-to-back -back trips, um, I had a couple of days off and they said, can you come up and help us carry all the gear? Because there's all this heavy bolting gear and stuff. And I said, yeah, no worries. So I went up with them and started going down and helping them bolt the canyon. They were showing me what they're doing and they were showing me some techniques. And I was like, wow, this could be really cool in Japan, actually. Um, because the Japan season, you know, it's uh, especially in Minakami, we have a really good high water season in spring as, as we get all the, the snow melt coming down. Uh, but some of the, the dam release really drops drops right down. So the thrill level drops. So I was sort of looking for something else to keep that adrenaline going over summer, really. So when I started going out with these canyoning guys in, in Nepal, it was like, this is it. This is, this is the thing, you know. Um, so I was pretty excited. I got back from Nepal after the spring season, probably somewhere in um, late April, uh, 98. And I just started going around, you know, looking around Minakami really for a start and just seeing 
what's here. And I, I just started finding all these amazing waterfalls. I was like, wait a minute, there's all this stuff right under my nose all that time. So um, I started uh, developing some courses here with the limited knowledge I'd gained, um, you know, from going out for a few days with these, with these guys in, um, in Nepal. And uh, as I said before, within Uncle Bear, I said, look, I'll start up the canyoning, um, canyoning section of it while I'm running the rafting. So it was, um, it was a win-win situation. I was still managing the rafting for him. But when the water was low, sometimes we'd get big groups of US military up, big guys, and it was super low water. They didn't, you know, they wanted more of a thrill. So I said to them, hey, well, how about you guys? What do you want to try canyoning today instead? They're like, yeah, man, this is, sounds great. So I had lots of um, tough guinea pigs to chuck down the canyon at the start and um, you know, see if I can uh, do it without breaking people, <laughs> uh, which I could for the most part. So, um, you know, and then I realized, you know, I really need to, up my game in terms of uh, technical technical skills. Um, so I went off to, off to the US and uh, did some canyoneering courses. They call it canyoneering in the US. Um, and while I was over there, I spent like six months in in uh, Arizona, sort of uh, learning canyoning techniques. And I spoke with those guys, and they told me that they had learned from these other European guys. So next, I started contacting the European guys, who were the sort of the the source of canyoning learning. So I was on this mission to sort of, you know, just want to be the best, uh, get the best knowledge and be the best canyoning guy next. I'd sort of gotten a little bit, um, I was a little bit over the rafting in, in Minakami because so many new outfits came in and the standards really dropped. And, you know, after traveling around the world with all these amazing guides and international world standard guides, and then the standard in Minakami really started to drop. So I was a bit disillusioned with the whole industry and said, okay, I want to start doing something else, but I want to do it at world standard. I want to do it like right up there. So I'll start this thing canyoning, but I want to, if I'm going to do it, I want to be right at the top of my game. So I started going around and, you know, trying to figure out who was the the best sort of um, people to, to, to teach me and, you know, best licenses to use. Um, the same thing happened, um, you know, as canyoning, as the canyoning boom started to sort of slowly die off, the media wanted the next cool thing. So canyoning became the next cool thing. So once again, we, we got all the same sort of uh, order, you know, all the all the the talent and you know uh, TV shows coming up. Then all the news programs, the business programs, all coming up to do these specials on on canyoning, and it just really it really took off. So within a couple of years of running the canyoning business within Uncle Bear, I uh, I said I need to go to my own base. You know, I had this little garage. Me and set off me and one guy in a little garage. It's like man, I need a proper mm. facility with doing mm. like. You know, we need like 10 guides now. We need this big of a city. So I uh, parted on good terms with him and left them pretty well set up still for, with guides. Um, a few a few of the team came across with me and then we slowly started to build up um, uh, under the Canyons, Canyons brand. Um, so that's, that's sort of awesome. how that, that started, yeah. Really awesome. So canyoning is through caves and things like that, is it? What would you describe it as for the average person who may not yeah, really know? Yeah, so canyoning actually, interestingly enough, did it started from caving. So, right. um, so cavers in France and Spain, the French say they're first, and the Spanish say they're first. But <laughs> cavers used to go into into cave systems, and then at certain points, they'd come across a waterfall or heavy flowing water, and they'd try and figure out how can we bypass this or how can we get through this. So they started to to practice it rather than going, you know, for um, eight hours underground and then finding a waterfall. They said, let's practice in these canyons, which is, you know, a nice little canyon section that's close by. Let's practice here. And then they started to realize, wait a minute, this is actually pretty cool as well, this canyoning thing. So um, that's how it sort of originated. So canyoning is actually, it's very, very small, smaller creeks and streams is usually what we use. You don't use big volume rivers or any sort of uh, larger rivers um, in general. Um, and usually involves uh, rappelling down waterfalls, jumping off cliffs into, into pools, scrambling down, climbing, um, sometimes sliding down like natural water slides. Um, so using a bunch of different techniques to, to navigate your way down a, a steep uh, canyon. And in the US, they, they do a bit of dry canyoning as well. Um, so there's no water in there, uh, just beautiful scenery, um, sometimes nasty stagnant water in some of the Utah canyons. But um uh, very very steep slot canyons in the US and sometimes dry, but in the in Japan it's mostly wet canyoning and predominantly in the world it's mostly wet canyons. So you know, in, in wetsuits, helmets, life jackets, harness like a 
a modified climbing harness and uh, using all these different techniques. Um, and it, canyoning has specific techniques that are a little bit different from climbing and other sports because we have the, the water factor to deal with mm. as well. Mm. What do you mm. think then makes it really attractive to people in Japan to come up and, and do this? Is it is it challenging themselves? Is it bonding for corporates? What What is it? Is it a variety yeah, of things, Mike? I, I, think it's a, I think it's different things for different people. If we look at sort of the markets that we have, uh, in the peak of summer, we have a lot of sort of 23 to sort of 30 year olds. And it's people that maybe just got out of university, they're in their first few years of working, but they want to reconnect with their mates from university or college and just get out and have fun really, um, is, is what we see a lot of in the, in the summer market. But um, we also have a lot of repeat customers who uh, maybe in their late 30s or 40s or 50s, um, they're you know, doctors or lawyers or have a bit more money and they'll come up every weekend or twice a month and they mm. want to keep on pushing to the next level. Mm. So similar to rafting, there's, there's a, where you grade rivers, there's also a cannon and grading system as well. So um, you can keep on pushing the limit, doing bigger waterfalls or, you know, bigger jumps, bigger slides. Uh, there's more water involved, things like this. So we've got a core bunch of repeaters that come up uh, insanely often uh, some people every weekend um, mm. to go out and push themselves to to uh, to get better at different techniques or mm. get to the next level of canyon. So mm -hmm. that's something that we've been working on too, to, to right. you know, with our product development over the last sort of ten years as well. Very cool. So, what some things that have surprised you about actually being in business for yourself in Japan as opposed to just sort of working in Japan? Some things are made extremely difficult and some things are extremely easy. Um, mm. For example, uh, adventure tourism in New Zealand is highly regulated, you know, um, in terms of qualifications, resource consent and these sort of mm. these sort of things. There's none of that in Japan. Zero. Whoa. So mm -hmm. you guys could go out tomorrow and start a rafting company. No worries. <laughs> No way. You have to compete yep. with you, Mike. Uh, Here you go. Game on. Let's go. <laughs> Watch out. Jandals in Japan rafting. Is that <laughs> right? Because that was what we were going to ask you was the, the regulatory stuff you must have gone through. But wow, yeah, that's really you know, interesting. Yeah, and that was something that we we really want the regulation because mm. it, it's sort of a little bit of a barrier to entry. You know, so every uh, Tom, Dick and Joe Tanaka can't sort of uh, just, just start up a set up a company which is sort of the the situation in japan there's 200 rafting companies in japan now um mm. which is an insane amount and of those ones that'll be on international standards would probably be something around 10 to 15 and that's quite a shock when you tell people from outside japan because they have this image that japan is so highly regulated it's very very difficult to do anything and with some industries for sure but adventure tourism is very very new in japan mm. um you know, I mean, it's hiking and mountaineering and these things have been around for a long time, but as mm. an industry, it's still very, still very young. Mm. And the Japanese government has a reluctance to put their hunko onto anything that's sort of uh, high risk or they deem as being high risk. Um, because if there's an accident, <laughs> who hunkled this you know who's who's got response <laughs> yeah. who's going to take so responsibility just for this? Who's, looking who's the gonna, other way yeah who's going to be the full guy you know so um oh my god i've been battling you know with the government for for years and years um to try and get some actually regulations put into place because now they're pushing international tourism it's like we, you know we want um international tourism we want to be world standards mm. i was like well the cards come for the horse here because they haven't got those those uh, base layers there yet for adventure tourism. But now, as you can see, the Japanese government adventure tourism is one of their one of their pillars of um, of, of tourism development at the moment. Mm. So I actually had an audience with um, Suga Sorti three years ago, just just before or around COVID or somewhere around mm. then. Mm. Um, I went and um, me and David Atkinson and a few other international players went and sort of, and I did a presentation about the the state of adventure tourism in Japan and the lack of regulations and what that's going to lead to. Um, you know, so there's surprisingly high amount of accidents within some parts of the industry, things like snorkeling. There's over 10 fatalities a year in, uh, in Okinawa alone. Mm -hmm. which for the number of participants it's got a it's got a uh you know 10 times worse rate than the likes of the great barrier reef and places in australia so there's obviously some problems uh there with um you know the way they've got safety standards and, and things like that so it is easy to set up but um you've got all this competition mm -hmm. and because there's so much competition 
everyone, what everyone knows, all these new players come in, they get really cheap equipment, their guides aren't trained or certified, and they have accidents. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, now with online travel agents, um, OTAs all sort of um, being the main port, people just go on there and look for the look for the cheaper the cheaper one. And mm-hmm. the average, you know, Joe Tanaka can go along on a tour and they they think, oh, it's great, that was good fun, the guides are really good. It might have been fun, but that safety level might have been very, very sketchy, but it's hard for the average person to sort of uh, to judge. So there's definitely, on that side of things, it was easy to set up, but, you know, I, I've been trying to push for actual regulations, mm-hmm. and I've been pushing that for a long time. Finally, there's been a few movements. You know, we were, I was part of a committee to set up guidelines for snorkeling and, and diving, which is interesting because I, I'm not really a, snor- a diver at all. I do free <laughs> diving and stuff like that. But anyway, um, they just wanted me to help with this, with the, with the systems. Yeah. Um, so there's, they're trying to, uh, I guess, test that out at the moment to see if it's uh, going to be um, adopted by the industry. And if it is, I think the the idea is to roll that out to to other mm-hmm. parts of the industry. But the whole system needs to be sort of reworked. There's no permission system for doing things in national parks. So you can just go in and really sort of just about as long as you're not cutting down trees or just you know destroying anything you can pretty much do what you want so once again that's not a good system at all as well so mm-hmm. we want to go and develop a tour actually we've been trying to develop a tour in Kamikochi a pack raft tour so we I looked at all the all the laws spoke to our lawyers about the laws around doing stuff in Kamikochi there's nothing that says you can't do pack rafting in Kamikochi I rang them up and said this is what I want to do they said oh, I would like if you didn't do that and I said why they said, oh, you're not allowed to use the rivers here. It's against the against the rules. I said, no, it's not. I've looked at all the rules. And they, they came back to me, you know, a day later. I said, actually, you're right. That's not against the rules. But if you do it, other people are going to copy you. And we know that you guys are safe. But if people unsafe do it, then, you know, they, it's going to create accidents. So I said, well, that's not my problem. That's your guys' issue to create rules, you know. So I'm actually deliberately going out and <laughs> doing things, you know, poking a few uh, – pokers in the fire to try and stir things up and uh mm-hmm. actually getting them to change some things at the moment so i'll be annoying a few people but hopefully it will create um, positive change in the future mm. interesting that was their thought process can you not come here and do that because people are going to copy you and then we'll have accidents and when then we'll have to do something we have to deal with it <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> oh um, it's a matter of time isn't it right, it's going yeah. to be someone else so yeah, interesting. Well, that's it. That's it. I mean, and that's a face that, you know, is everywhere we've gone. Um, I mean, when you're pioneering like, for canyoning as well, we, um, when we first started, it's like, okay, let's go and get certified for this. Let's get regular, you know, talk to the regulatory bodies and say, you've got to do this. So we went through this huge, like six, seven month process, huge stacks of paperwork to get permission to run a certain canyon. And we're like, yes, this could be the ticket for, you know, making sure that everyone in Japan needs to get, you know, some sort of resource consent to run somewhere. The next year we went back to them and said, okay, we want to re- renew and do the paperwork. They said, actually, don't worry about it. That's not really needed. <laughs> you know? So we're like, what? What was that six months? So, um, and now it actually seems like um, some areas are wanting to put in some systems and the mm-hmm. national parks people and that are starting to realize actually we do need to think about this, but it's pretty hard. It's sort of, it can't just be done in a local area. They need to work it from central government as well. Everything moves quite slowly. <laughs> yeah, here, it's so. been consistent though too. And I think you don't give up your lobbying because things do take do change in Japan eventually. If you you wear them down a bit, but you got to be consistent and not just do a one sort of one and one and done. You you're doing what you're doing, Mike. You know. Yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty stubborn. So if yeah. I think it's the right way of doing things, I, I'm being. I'll keep on banging my head and say, well, I, I can see the wall's got a little dent in it now. So, <laughs> um, it might fall down soon. You never know. Yeah, yeah it might yeah. fall down. What's Japan taught you then about people and business here? Yeah, I mean, Japan's taught me a lot about, you know, doing business. I mean, especially in a, in a, in a different culture. And I guess that's one of the really fascinating things about doing business in a, in a foreign country is that you're continually learning from just guiding to, to starting to run your own business and, in a sort of a in an industry that didn't really exist so trying to create an industry running around trying to to do things the right way but sometimes people you learn that okay well it's better to ask forgiveness than um than permission sometimes because there is no permission 
So just go out and do it and prove that that's actually a good thing for the area for a start. Make sure you talk to the locals and get some understanding, but um, show them that the benefits, you know, oh, look, um, I'm going to book people in at your accommodation to come come with me and things like this. Sometimes you've just got to go out there and, and show that it's going to work because um, there'll be too many naysayers at the start are going to shoot you down. And, you know, all of the Japanese sort of um, governments they just they're looking for an, a reason to say no you know they're not looking for a reason to say yes so if you ask they're going to say no <laughs> so a lot of time that's <laughs> don't ask but make sure that the other locals are on your side so go out go out drinking with a few of the locals and you know um get them on find out who the key players are and just mm, get make sure right. that they understand who you are that you're doing things for the right reasons and they'll support you you know so I think early on in Minakami, you know, it was uh, at the start, it was like, oh, where the Kiwis were coming in, blah, 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 but, you know, a little bit gung ho, but um, dial it back a bit. And then you can do things that I call it the Gaijin card. You know, sometimes you can pull out the Gaijin card and do things the sort of the, the Gaijin way. But then you've also got to know the the Nemoashi sort of, you know, the sort of going around and making sure you cover all the all, all the locals talk with everyone you should talk to and um, don't get anyone's uh, nose out of line. Sometimes do the jet things the Japanese way. So um, I think it's starting in Minakami, it was really good to connect with local uh, pensions, like little uh, bed and breakfasts. And all the hotels were too big. They didn't agree with things like rafting or canyoning. The tourism association back in the day said that's not tourism <laughs> so you guys can't you can't join the tourism association um you know we're going down the river and the, the fishermen were throwing rocks at us um this is our river you can't be on this river they have the rights the the rights to fish the river they don't own the rights to the river but then you know it's just finding a few of those key um players locally that you know want to champion you guys and you know we found a few bed and breakfasts that had been overseas and been rafting and had some bit of influence in the community and and then the customers started to stay at their bed and breakfast and come rafting with us and then that spread to a lot more bed and breakfasts and then some real cans and some hotels started to, oh wait a minute these guys are getting quite a few you know um quite a few customers through this so it sort of happened at a good time because the bubble had burst in japan and the you know all the the huge groups you know they were getting 300 people from toshiba or sony or whatever coming up or 500 people come up on buses and and you know having these big parties with for the company that sort of thing that just sort of started to, to go down and as that started to happen the adventure tourism started to come in, the rafting started to come in and and create you know more of an fit sort of you know um, mm -hmm. independent travelers coming up to enjoy the area so the hotels now after a while started to take notice everyone's oh wait a minute this could be a good thing you know interesting um, isn't it right and then being refused to join the tourism association you're now a board member of mina Tourism <laughs> association yeah yeah that. Things, i mean things, how did you things, do that was it a matter of what you just said that guiding card plus the nemawashi the getting to know people and becoming familiar think, them familiar with you what happened there yeah i think so i mean part of the thing was you know with the Nemoashi well, we and those local champions as we started to make friends with the local the local drinking team for better want a better better word but you know the young younger guys sort of closer to our age who um sort of understood and thought that this was actually a pretty cool thing for the town so we used mm. to go out drinking with them we used to go out to the local all the local matsuri the festivals and stuff mm. help them with you know preparation carry the omikoshi and the matsuri with them um, and then we came up with a really cool idea. Um, well, it was actually from the town. Um, some of those young guys said, can we do an event where we raft from Minakami all the way to Tokyo over five days? And, you know, sort of take water samples along the way and say, the, you know, the water at the source is this clean. How can we, you know, and down it changes to this, you know, sort of a, a message from, from the water source sort of thing. So all there's about 30 of us you know some rafting guides and then a bunch of the young guys we all got together and rafted for five days down to tokyo and presented all this stuff to the the mirror tokyo at the time and that was a great sort of bonding session and you know drinking together every night all down the rafts together and they got really got to know us and they understood we're here for the right reason we love minikami we want to see it uh, prosper in the future we're not here just here for a quick profit you know so that that was the game changer and then now those guys were all sort of people that 
were in the city council or just you know the young guys at that time but now they've moved up through the ranks so mm. you know like the the head of the you know the head of the kunkel kyokai or the the head of this department within the akaba so mm. as as the old the old guard slowly slowly changed you know um which is the same in a lot of countries really that the the younger people sort of bought the the new ideas and the um and the fresh energy and they said look we see adventure tourism as being one of the um, and I guess as of about eight, 10 years ago, inbound tourism started to be a big thing. So we see these things as being real opportunities. So um, uh, I guess wow. my name got thr- thrown into the into the hat there for the tourism board because um, I guess I'm doing both of those things. I went back and did um, uh, post-grad in um, tourism, sustainable tourism development um, while I was doing stuff over here. Mm. And New Zealand is lot, was light years ahead of, of uh, Japan in that, in that respect of tourism study so mm. I used that knowledge to try and, you know, it was sort of like a sort of case study for me. I'm just been learning all this stuff. So I put it into my mm. business or I'm learning about this, uh, you know, destination marketing. So let's try and use it within the, within the local DMO. So um, once again, I see my role. Sometimes I have to be the guide and say, no, wait a minute. What are you guys doing? Mm. Where everyone else is saying, oh yeah, maybe we should just do that. You know, I'm like, no, this isn't what we do guys. You know, it's, it's, let's go back to, our focus on what we do you know um so and that was good we actually um we brought another guy um tony everett um who was used to be the um another kiwi he's based in japan actually um he used to be the head of the queenstown dmo and when japan started this big push for let's we want to create dmos you know more da- using data to you know proper marketing all this kind of stuff away from the old kunkul kyokai sort of tourism association sort of um mentality they put they wrote this huge paper about some of the best case uh, DMOs around the world, and Queenstown got picked up as one of the best DMO um, examples in the world. I said, "Wait a minute, <laughs> I know that guy, and he's coming back to Japan." So we got him to come yeah. up and help with our tourism strategy, nice. um, and and lead through, lead through mm-hmm. that. So um, that was a a great kickstart to sort of say, "Okay, this is what a DMO should be doing." So that yeah, using like- using some of those connections. Yeah, it sounds like that's just added so much credibility to you and trust in the community. And that's also broadened out because before we started recording, you were telling us about the rural tourism development activities that you're also involved in and Kumamoto, Akita, like from north to south, you're you're doing it there too. People are pulling on your knowledge and experience and expertise. And obviously you're a very funny character as well, right? Yeah. To get the message across, right? You, Cause you've got to be a good person to be able to do all this. It's not just owning all this knowledge and experience. You've got to be able to deliver it too. So tell yeah. us a bit more about that as well. The other activities. I started doing some sort of tourism consulting, I guess around about six years ago, six, seven years ago, some places maybe, they wanted to develop a bit of adventure tourism. So they mm. came and said, okay, can you help us with some, with some ideas here for creating something? So I was starting to go out to some of these areas um, originally with the national parks, um, Japan national parks, because they want to do increase inbound. So I was going around the national parks and sort of, um, you know, sort of doing some assessments of the area and what were their sort of resources and things like that and tell them how they could be a little bit more inbound ready, some of the directions they had to go. And, as I was going around, it's like, well, this is all good, just consulting, but it really doesn't bring people to the area so much. So what can I do to actually bring people here? So I was like, I need to create a travel agency um, to, to bring people to rural rural Japan. So the idea was going around in my head. And then finally in 2019, I was like, all right, I, I want to do this. And I hooked up with a, an old mate, um, Shannon Walker, who used to work for Tourism New Zealand. He was back in Queenstown working for a helicopter company, doing a lot of their marketing and product dev. So I spoke to him and he said, hey, it's funny you should say, you know, talk about this because I was just thinking about heading back to Japan and wondering what to do Um, because he was doing a lot of sales around the world at at big luxury events for the helicopter company. Every time he spoke about New Zealand, I said, oh, you lived in Japan. Tell us a bit more about Japan. So he he (laughs) felt that there was a real sort of yeah uh, you know mm. need in the market we decided let's let's start up something so, so our sort of main goal was to try and create products that that drive more business more tourists to to rural japan um so 2019 we started it up you know rugby world cup starting with the hiss and a roar and then corona hit <laughs> um so we're like oh okay uh, what do we do now and then 
over Corona, I mean, the Japanese government put a lot of money into um, into tourism. They said, well, mm. well, we've got this downtime. Let's really develop tourism. And one of the big themes started came out as adventure tourism. It's like, well, we just started this adventure tourism specific travel company. And, you know, I sort of already had a name for consulting. So it was, gave us this opportunity to, to start traveling around all these different areas, literally create product for our own company, really. But um, at the same time, just um, help them with all the issues that all these places have. Um, sometimes it's to do with branding, product development. A lot of the time it's to do with the communication between the stakeholders, which is, mm. isn't really on our... <laughs> Uh, in our job uh, description, but it's sort of something we have so to end important. up doing. Yeah, very important mm. to end up doing. Um, so mm. you ended up uh, just traveling around and doing a, a lot of uh, dev in different areas. And, you know, as you mentioned before, I've uh, been doing a lot of stuff with the Matagi, who get sort of um, called bear hunters, but they don't actually hunt bears for like two weeks a year. Um, they're actually the sort of the guardians of the forest is what I call them. So um, so yeah, got some cool product that we're developing with the um, mm -hmm. Matagi who are related to the sort of the Ainu and the Emishi people who are um, other sub tribes um, mm -hmm. up in that area. Um, it's got their own sort of language, Matagi language and, um, mm -hmm. you know, all these religion and culture. Um, so really, very interesting. And then uh, down in Kumamoto, they had they actually had floods down in uh, Kumamoto uh, three years ago where it, it wiped out half the town. And they had a big rafting community there as well. So I was trying to think, oh, what can I do? And then they, I got a uh, request from there. Can you come down and help? So I said, oh, yeah, look, I'll come down half as volunteer. So um, yeah. so I went down and started doing some stuff down there and uh, been doing some stuff down there for a few years. So, yeah, so that's where I, where the travel agency came from. And just over COVID, it sort of um, it sort of led to all these other consulting opportunities. Amazing, which, right? <laughs> which is really fulfilling because you get to yeah. go and work with local stakeholders and, um, you know, it's a lot of times if you're in your own space the whole time, you don't realize some of the, uh, I don't know, the treasures that you have there, you know, and yeah. maybe a lot of them haven't really traveled a lot overseas mm -hmm. or don't really know adventure tourism, but you go along and you go, oh, wow, you guys have got this. And they're like, yeah, what's 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 yeah. special about that? It's like, mm. man, foreigners are gonna love this, you know. I was in Kumamoto, this Hitoyoshi area, they have these 400 year old um shochu brewing buildings, you know. So you can walk in there and they've got the 400 year old clay pots where they can still you can get the 60 year old shochu that they brewed 60 years ago and you can taste it, you know. It's like, wow, this is just blows me away. So there's all these hidden treasures all around Japan, just mm. I guess uh locals they don't see uh the value mm. in it, you know um so exactly. you're helping them through a separate new set of eyes tell them what they've got right in front of them yeah i guess you know they say in japan sort of um you know bakamono wakamono yosumono you know sort of mm. uh, someone who's got these crazy stupid ideas or you know young people with new ideas or yosumono people from the outside to come in so i'm not that young anymore but i might be crazy and now uh, from the outside so um Definitely, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really a passion one. I really love product development and learning about new areas and new cultures. That's great. Um, Did you imagine this, though, from those days back then when you were working with another rafting company to this? Had, could you have imagined this would happen? No, nah, I mean... Yeah. Back, in, back in the day, you know, I had this, you know, I had this image of Minakami becoming Queenstown. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's like you've got these beautiful big lakes, you've got amazing ski resorts, you've got these great rivers on scene you got the infrastructure to get up here so i said wow this has got a lot of the things you know um the resources that someone like queenstown has uh, even more you know because we've got you know 20 million people just down the road that that could be become customers you know yeah. so i had this uh, sort of image that this could be developed i actually took the mayor and a bunch of the stakeholders in 2010 to queenstown we went with the mayor and went around and saw all the different things i showed them this is what a tourism town is and they came back and they they created a bylaw here for adventure tourism um for safety um which sort of worked in, in minakami so that really in increased the the standards in minakami but mm -hmm. i mean at the start you know so i said when i was you know 20 21 years old it's just like i just want to sit on the back of a raft and talk <laughs> to chicks and drink beer and <laughs> have barbecues but yeah. as you as you progress you know um <laughs> through the industry you learn more and you, you know you get that deeper connection with nature and you start to think more about why do you do this you know oh, i love doing this because i love connecting with nature and I, I love sharing nature with you know um that connection with nature with other people you know you start to think a little bit uh, a bit deeper about things and mm -hmm. then once you get your own business and, and everything sort of sorted it's like well what more can i can do do for the community 
and then okay not just this community how can we replicate this in other communities you know mm. how do you how do you spread that so we use Love a key, keyword at canyons we say refresh you know we 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 refresh ourselves we refresh communities you know we refresh the customers that come here you know and that's creating connections and and learning creating growth and just creating a really positive fun environment so we're always trying to increase that that re refresh um sort of level mm. around the different areas that we're going brilliant because you so, call yourself the chief refreshing officer don't you exactly you know so <laughs> i love it yeah so that was the sort of you know the the thing that i came up with that's our job is to refresh brilliant. refresh people real communities. and now we're trying you know with the sustainability we're trying to refresh nature you know by exactly. putting in more sustainable practices and and share that more with the community as well so mike if you'd distill it into the one gem the one nugget of advice you'd have for people who want to do business in japan what would it be what would you boil it down to yeah i think you know it, it may be a little bit cliche but i think especially in japan relationship building is very very important the japanese if you can create a trusting relationship it doesn't matter if another supplier or another operator is slightly cheaper or has some better terms if they like you and if they trust you then they're going to, they're very, very loyal people. Um, mm. They'll really stick with you, you know? So I think going out of your way to learn some Japanese etiquette and manners, they can see that you're trying, you know, bring an omiyage, things like mm. this, you know, invite them to your home in New Zealand to stay with your family, things like this. If you can create that trust, um, then, you know, you'll have a, a very long, great long-term relationship. I think everywhere we go, it's, it's, we try to create, trust within the communities and trust with the people we work with and you know they understand what we're trying to achieve mm. so it's a little mm. bit difficult sometimes when you're working with um with city officers because every three years they the the person in charge gets mm. changed over and you gotta start that whole process again but if you can find those key players and really just build that trust i think um mm. that's going to go a really really long way yeah, you mentioned some things about how you did that, like actual things you did. So you mentioned, you know, you got your team and you helped out at the the matsuri, the festival. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's you know appearing at various drinking parties and yeah. and all that's really important. Is there anything else that you think that's kind of a Japanese way of building trust that potentially New Zealanders wouldn't think to do? I mean, it's it's hard to think of it when people. I'm thinking like a Jap, you're a New Zealand businessman, and you're coming to Japan for a, a week, and what can you do within that week? You know, it's sort of. Um, yeah, I think uh, you might also be inspiring some people who are already in Japan to right. Um, you know, uh, to maybe try something new or yeah. or whatever. Like, yeah. What does that look I think, like? I think mm. being part of you know, lot, you know, there's lots of different associations and kaigi and things like that. Being this, being a, in a part of as many different things as you can, you know, it takes up a lot of your time. I'm mm. in so many different <laughs> um, little local body things at the moment, but you know, they can see that you're really passionate about um, that area and you're trying your best. Um, I think that's, um, you know, whether it's being a part of the shore ball done, which is the you know, oh, fire, right. volunteer, yeah, the fire, fire, volunteer, volunteer fire yeah. brigade. Um, which is sort of like a, just an, another cover for another drinking drinking session, mm. really. But, but you know, all these little things, you know, for us, we created uh, some events, you know, so we created the Minakami Outdoor Festival and we get everyone involved and all using local vendors and local people like this so that they can see that you're trying to do something that involves the community. We do free tours for the local kids, you know, we'll take them out and do, create these special days for the local school um, mm. and things like that. So really showing that, you know, you really want to be part of that community. I think it's the same just about anywhere around the world, but in Japan, definitely in, in small town Japan, got to got to really uh, to make a big effort to, to do all these things. Yeah, and I think from the get-go too, it's not just partway through when you realize, oh, I should be in the community to get some advantage but to have already started that way back so you're obviously showing mm. that you're building on what was maybe a small contribution at the beginning to something larger rather than just deciding to do that when it's going to be some advantage to yourself i think that's great great information there any gold mines you think might be there sitting waiting for kiwis that haven't quite spotted them and without uh, probably giving away all your new ideas <laughs> things, Mike. yeah i've got a, i've got quite a big list which Ooh. um I'm, I'm not going to share but if, i think definitely in the um in the adventure tourism and tourism i mean that's really mm. what I'm, i've been looking at mm. a lot there's a lot of potential for development um in japan and it's such a you know um 
a hot country to visit at the moment, you know, very, very popular. Um, I think this, there could be some really, really good partnerships with um, New Zealand operators, you know, whether it's, you know, sort of like your Kiwi experience style things um, that they haven't really, haven't really got going in Japan, you know, bus trips or other sort of uh, core sort of, you know, things like jet boating or things like there's, there's lots of potential and lots of ideas that I've got at the moment. So anyone in, in New Zealand that um, has got some, uh, got some, some ideas as well, um, throw, them, yeah. throw them at me. Cause um, as Good. I said, for me, it's about ex expanding, yeah. you know, if, uh, bringing that sort of wealth of knowledge and sort of expertise to more different areas is going to be a win-win situation. So I'm Absolutely. keen to partner with, um, with people. And, and if, even if it's not me, just introduce you to, to other people that I know to, yeah. to make things mm. happen in, in, in different areas. Cause I'm, I'm right. passionate about that rural development. Fantastic. Are there any activities or promotions you've got coming up, Mike, in your industry and in your company that you'd like to share? We're just starting off for the season. So glamping's about to kick off. Um, if you want to get out of the city and, and uh, you know, just come and chill out, we've got this beautiful riverside, riverside location here. So come and chill out, jump on a raft, jump down the canyon, have a barbie. Um, we have you quite a few... New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc? We do. Oh, good! Awesome. We have, yeah, New Zealand, we have New Zealand. We have New Zealand wines and some local beers from up here. Very nice. Really good, oh, really good local nice. craft beer here. Lamping. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah so that's one of our things we try, try to push at the moment. So, um, but it just yeah, get people out of the city and just come and detox and just get into nature here. It's um, detox. <laughs> Detox, <laughs> detox and it's, retox and retox <laughs> yeah retox in the night detox in detox the day. refresh and then yeah. retox yeah. okay well that sounds very lots of lots of fun and is there something else though that we didn't cover today that you were dying to tell us i guess the only other thing is yeah i didn't really talk about outdoor japan so um outdoor japan is once again 2019 i bought into outdoor japan because i wanted to say how can we promote japan in general um, you know, now we've got some tours we can sell, but how do we promote it? So I bought into Out to Japan, which is a media company, which has been here for 20 years. And it's pretty much promoting adventure tourism, adventure travel within Japan. So um, it's a free magazine. You'll see it around various, various locations around Japan. Pick it up. It's also outdoorjapan.com if you want to read this, uh, have a look on the site. Got mm. some great, uh, great writers, um, and great photographers. Um, so check it out. Awesome. We will link that up so people can click through. Yeah, fantastic. So I'm so excited. I need to come to Minokami. How do we get to Minokami, this magical place, Minokami? So easy. If, know. if you're in Tokyo, jump from either Tokyo or Ueno Station, the Joy to Shinkansen, 70 minutes. Boom, you're in Minokami. Uh, we do all pickups at the Shinkansen Station, pickups and drop offs. So get up here Brilliant. and we'll look after you the rest of the time. That's awesome. You guys are lucky. You've got a Shinkansen that comes through your way. I'm in Fukushima and we don't have a Shinkansen uh, here on the coast. Right. It's just the, yeah, just a sort of <laughs> rickety drain all the way up. Yeah. Very jealous. Okay. Anyway, well, thank you so much for being a wonderful Jandal in Japan, helping Japan to make the most of what they have here and doing whatever you can with uh, your knowledge and being a great representative of New Zealand for us here completely the yeah. award goes to you i mean amazing thanks so much mike for your time today cheers guys nice to chat and look forward to seeing you up in minicum yeah we'll be there well thank you to chief refreshment officer mike harris for that whoa how exciting he really refreshed my mood as well i was coming yeah. dull monday morning uh, wow well, yeah, mike yeah. you really revved me up that was yeah. so fun really that was enjoyed fun. that yeah yeah that was fun that's what our definition of fun is by the way everybody mm. loved it such an yeah. engaging conversation and how much potential in, does japan have for collaborations with new zealand and adventure tourism going forward like what the things they don't see or don't mm. do see but don't realize so just you know like he like mike said getting that extra set of eyes of someone who's mm. from outside yeah, uh, you're maybe a bit crazy. <laughs> you I love yeah. his expressions. Yeah. You know, bringing yeah. people, yeah, showing them that there are things there that can really work for their region. Mm. Yeah, they're differently. And it's just it. every every little town across Japan has the same problems, right? They, you know, the same people live there for hundreds of years and they don't see 
what's around them and they don't think it's special or interesting or that, that they could turn it into something that benefits the town in right. a positive way, right? And, and they're the, struggling so for various reasons. So. And you've done that in your nearby town as well too. In a minuscule way compared to what Mike has However, achieved. However, it all adds yeah, up, I, doesn't it? And people notice. Yeah, right? it sounds very – it's a very similar story, right? I could – I bring my friends and things from Tokyo or overseas into this little town and they're like, nothing here to see. But when I bring people from outside, they're like, whoa, look at this, look at that. Hey, that's so cute. And yeah, there's lots of cute things really there. Fresh eyes on something that looks very simple, even to just Japanese people. So, mm. but I jotted down a few of those things he said, like the shore ball dam, right? The volunteer fire. Mm. Okay, joining that free tours for local kids, you know, doing uh, an outdoor festival, all the things that he's done to bring people together and people love festivals here. Yeah. And why not do yeah. that? With all if you can get groups? included into a festival, that is a surefire way of making a big dent in that trust thing. That you yeah. Because those are run by the the old hands in town, right? Or the, the, the families who've been there forever. So if you can become known to them, yeah, right. it, and trusted by them because you do a good job, you show up and you help, yeah, it's yeah. it's very well thought of. So right. festivals are surprising, surprising one. Wow. Yeah, get yourself yeah. involved and in a festival, fun, but also and it's super fun. In that way. Yeah, super fun. Yeah, we did and that earlier in the year. I, I had all these questions as the lawyer revved up to do talk about regulations, and, and you were waiting to get into the regulations, and nothing. it didn't happen. There was yeah. nothing. <laughs> A little bit of paperwork, right, for the first first round, but not mm. after that, and that's interesting. But Isn't I that also shocking. Really? It is shocking, but I picked up regulations are a good barrier to entry. Was one it of the things, be. right? Yes, should right. be. So mm. I thought that was interesting, and it looks like he's sort of chipping away, right? Like mm. at a sculpture, he's chipping away and trying to get the the dint into the wall. He's going to get there eventually, I think, with building up some regulations to help his industry his reputation his areas that he's working in and make it good for everybody who's mm. going up there i'm horrified by the lack Ooh. of regulations shocking yeah and that's good to know right because if you want to try one of these things you want to go scuba diving or you know rafting no, you. whatever <laughs> yeah if, make sure you're using a, a reputable yeah. one that yeah. is you know got safety things happening yeah. yeah oh my god oh, oh my chills. goodness yeah the other mm. cool thing i think mike was saying was you know he started from his own love of canyoning and rafting and he's built out this tourism industry in a different way like consulting but beyond that not only consulting in his region but beyond that so just there's so many things that can emerge from the one thing that you've got what else mm. could everybody else be doing too mm. uh, from that little section that they they love you know, mm. they can build on to make more businesses. Well, it was really awesome. Yeah, yeah, that, that help, all help each other. Yeah, yeah, mm, fantastic. Well wow. done, Mike. We yes. enjoyed that and hope everyone reaches out to you to do some glamping, canyoning, canyoneering. Yeah, get away from the from the big smoke and yes. up into the, the Queenstown of Kanto. I think it's part of Kanto, considered part of Kanto up there, or is it Hokuriku? It's certainly I don't know. I have to check my geography. But Queenstown yeah. of Hongshu. Shall we give it that Queenstown much, of Japan, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks for listening. Make sure you check out our guests' links in the show notes. This podcast is brought to you today by Catherine O'Connell Law and Pod Launch with Jane. If you have a great story you think should be on the show, come and find us on LinkedIn or Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time. Mata ne!